Um, I've been asked to give somewhat of an unconventional talk, um, and I'm going to bring I'm going to begin that talk rather unconventionally. Global warming. Some say irreversible consequences are 30 years away. 30 years? That won't affect me. Well, um, I'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes, but um, what I'm going to be telling you about is an experience, a journey that I went on in leaving uh, academia. I had spent virtually my entire life at one academic institution or another, some 30 years at Georgia Tech, and um, decided to leave uh, to advocate work as chief scientist for the Environmental Defense Fund. And one of the projects I worked on was that public service announcement that you just saw, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. And so this rather unconventional talk will be a little bit about my experiences as an environmental advocate, why I made that choice, and where I see some of the key issues facing us, and how, um, if any of you choose, how you can make contributions in that direction. So one of the things that, in reflecting on why I made the choice to leave, leave academia, and let me just mention that I'm back in academia now, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, was recognizing the decision process that I went through that largely related to climate change, starting out in the 80s, being rather skeptical about the whole issue, and at some point or another, ultimately coming to the conclusion that this was a real problem and we needed to do something about it, and got me to begin thinking about the nature of uncertainty. And I discovered in my years in Environmental Defense Fund that a large part of the misunderstanding that we have in talking to both the public and to lots of policymakers is in trying to explain the difference between the kinds of uncertainties that we think about and the kinds of uncertainties that policymakers need to think about. And so the first thing I want to talk about is a house of cards. Um, and this is a house of cards on a cat, but it could be a dog or a pigeon, it doesn't really matter. And um, quite often, I think, when scientific issues related to the environment are discussed in the public domain or with policymakers, they often mistake that discussion for a discussion about a house of cards. And if one of those cards can be pulled out, the whole house comes down. And in fact, that's not at all the way lots of science works, and that's certainly not the way earth sciences and environmental sciences work, because we are largely an, a, a, a science where there's a lot of synthesis, where we're piecing together different pieces of a puzzle. And it's really like a jigsaw puzzle. And I'm going to illustrate that with you with a jigsaw puzzle. But in this particular case, I'm going to take the puzzle pieces out instead of putting the puzzle pieces in. And so as you so imagine you're putting a jigsaw puzzle together, and you, have, you don't have the box tops. So you don't know what the picture is. And as you begin to take those pieces or put those pieces in place, at a certain point, you look at this and you say, aha, I know what this picture is. Now, there are puzzle pieces that are missing or remaining, if you will. And as scientists, we're going to be arguing about those puzzle pieces for decades, and they're incredibly important. In the case of climate, they're going to relate to how well we can predict what's going to happen in the future and how well we can mitigate. But the basic picture is here. And at some point in, a, in an issue, when you've got about 60 or 70 70 percent of those pieces together, you know whether it's a, it's a still life or a pastoral scene or a picture of the earth. And in large part, for many environmental issues, like climate change, we have reached this point. We know what the basic picture is. We know that the globe is warming, that it's largely due to human activities, and the consequences will likely be serious if we don't know anything about it. We'll continue to argue about the puzzle pieces. And it's important that we as scientists are able to communicate that fact to the public and to policymakers while we continue to argue about those individual jigsaw puzzle pieces. And when I came to that um, conclusion, um, I realized that it was time for me to try to make a difference, and I went to, to environmental defense. And let me tell you about, in reflecting on those years and spent most of my time in climate change, 
Where I think ultimately the major environmental problem, socio-economic environmental problem lies, for many people when you hear them talk, they'll say ultimately, fundamentally, the problem is population. The population continues to grow, more stuff is needed, and therefore that's the problem. We need to, we need to do something about population. In fact, I think for, for my generation growing up, that was the problem, but in fact, that's no longer the problem. And a natural process of human society has largely going to solve that problem, at least we believe. This is a picture showing human population over a very, very, very long period of time. And you can see the population grew and then was kind of stable in the last 2,000 years at about a half a, a half a billion people. And then right around the industrial era, you see the population took off. This shows you another picture more recently of the last 1,000 years or so. Again, fairly constant population until uh, the industrial period right around here and the population increased. Interestingly enough, there were major catastrophes, if you will, the Black Plague and another plague uh, that occurred in the, in the, around the 1400s and the 1600s, 1700s. And they actually caused little blips in the population growth, but are really pretty, pretty, pretty insignificant. And things like AIDS and so forth, most demographies will t tell you are also going to be blips at best. So this looks like it's really bad. And we see population continuing to increase seemingly exponentially. And my goodness, we have a problem. And in fact, if you look at the demography in a little bit more detail, it's actually a lot more, more encouraging. This is population increasing as a function of time from 1750, just like I showed you. But if you look at the population increment, the number of births, if you will, or the increase in population per year, this is in millions of, millions of people per year, you see that that increment actually peaked in the late 1990s and has begun to decrease. And what is that, de what is that decrease about? It ha and in fact, projections of population, there's a large uncertainty in, the, in how, what, what the population will be by the end of the century. But most projections in population, most central projections, predict that the population are gonna, is going to peak or begin to stabilize somewhere around mid-century. And if we're lucky, probably stabilize at somewhere about nine, nine and a half billion people. Now, that's a whole lot of people. But that basically says that it, the best predictions are that the population will stabilize. And in fact, there is very, very little we can do to influence this number because a large part of that is already built into who, who the people are currently here today. And the reason for that has to do with something called the demographic transition. There are two demographic transition, transitions that societies go through, demographers tell us. Populations tend to be fairly stable, and this is the way pop human population was for many, many, for, for some thousand years or so. And then at some point, with an increase in standard of living, an increase in, in, in technology and, and, and larger uh, production of food, improvements in medical resources, what ends up happening is the birth rate, which had been basically equal to the death rate, stays constant, but the death rate goes way down. And as the death rate goes way down, the population increases tremendously, and the population continues to increase. But societies go through another, another transition. In, in Europe, largely, we went through, we go, we've already gone through that transition. In the United States, with the exception of immigration, we've gone through that transition. Um, South America is currently going through this transition. China is looking like it's going through the transmi transition, mostly through government interference. It, India is approaching it, Africa is somewhat way. And what happens is there is a transition that the society goes through, and demographers don't entirely agree about what, what is the nature of that transition. It might be going from an agrarian society to an urban society, and therefore there's less benefit of having lots of kids. Some people believe that it has to do with the liberation of women. When women sort of get out of the home and get educated and begin to work, they simply decide that the family is going to be smaller. Or it could be an economic decision that it simply doesn't, not worth it to have that many children. Whatever it is, society goes through that transition and the birth rate decreases and, some, and, and we end up, the birth rate and the death rate eventually stabilize and we end up getting a stable, stabilized, stable, stable population. And as I said, many societies in the West have gone through that transition. Some societies in the developing world are going through that transition, and demographers predict that the others will go through that transition this century, and, and population will stabilize. That's the good news. Here is, if you will, another part of the good news, but also the bad news. This is simply data without attributing any causation to it. <coughs> 
This is the total fertility rate. And typically what you want for zero population growth or stable population is you want a fertility rate of around two. It could be slightly larger than two. Um, less than two, people get sort of freaked out because it means the population will decrease, but let's not worry about that. And then you see these large populations. And if you simply plot the fertility rate as a function of GDP per capita, you find, not surprisingly, that the societies that have gone through the demographic transition and have gone to this other way of living, this more urbanized, industrialized way of living, tend to also be a lot more affluent tend to want to be more materialistic and be more consumer-oriented. And therefore, they have larger GDPs per capita. They, they consume more stuff. And these societies, as they go through that demographic transition, are going to want to live, most likely, like most of us in this room live. And there are two or three things that we can do as a society is, we can decide that they're not going to have those resources, and we can try to have sort of a barricade society where we barricade less the have-nots from the haves. I think that's an unstable situation. I know that in the United States we have large amounts of quote-unquote illegal immigration. I think it's perfectly understandable if you're living in a place where you don't have opportunity and you don't have food and you see somewhere else where there's lots of opportunity and lots of food, you're simply going to go there and try to take advantage of it. Alternatively, we can try to share the resources, and if we share the resources, we've got some other issues to, to consider. So let's take a look at those. Let's think about carbon emissions, and we all know about carbon emissions and climate. Incidentally, Ram, Ram is going to be talking about climate, so I'm not going to talk about the specifics of the science of climate here, and I'll leave it to him. He'll do a great job. So this is just taking a few countries and plotting their per capita CO2 emissions and their energy intensity, if you will, their carbon emissions per GDP dollar. And you can see that India and China are somewhat anomalous in that and have huge energy intensities, and that's a large part of the problem. But one also needs to look at the energy use or the CO2 emissions per capita, and of course China is the king of the hill. Some of the other developing countries are right behind, I'm sorry, the US is the king of the hill, sorry. And then there are a variety of other countries that are much lower. And there's a large discussion in the international community about reaching climate stability and many, many countries argue that in reaching climate stability, that stability has to come through some kind of convergence where we all emit the same CO2 per capita. That's certainly what the developed world needs to be. How is that going to happen? So here I have a plot. This is the current CO2 emissions. This is the same countries. I'm sorry, it's a little bit hard to read. These numbers here are just reproducing the other numbers. These are the tons per, per dollar and the tons per capita for each of these individual countries. And what this, for example, this red line shows, this red line shows the world's CO2 emissions if everybody in the world, 6.7 billion people, lived like someone in Haiti or lived like the average in the world or lived like people live in the European Union or lived like the United States. And if the whole world wanted to and suddenly became like Americans, this is the amount of CO2 that we would emit worldwide. And if the population increased to 9 billion, this is the amount of CO2 we would emit. This is the amount of CO2 emissions that we think, to we think we need to have globally by the end of the century, optimistically, in order to stabilize, quote unquote, stabilize CO2 concentrations. And so what we as a society and as a scientific community need to do is to need, need to do a number of things. First of all, figure out how to, to um, distribute that natural resource, if you will, energy, or CO2 emissions, if you will, to all these different peoples of the world in some equitable, stable way, and at the same time not admit some limitation that the globe has in terms of CO2 emissions, and that's going to be a tough, tough issue. Now, of course, a lot of this, we believe, is going to be through, C through technology, through decarbonization of the energy. But here's another issue that I don't think we can, quote, unquote, decarbonize. It has to do with nitrogen. So here's the same group of countries, more or less, and this is the number of kilocalories per person they eat per day. And here is the grams of nitrogen per person they eat. And that's basically a function of eating protein. And there's a certain minimum amount that you have to eat, which is somewhere probably right around here. And most of the world is pretty close to that. There's a significant amount of the world that's undernourished, as you saw before. And a lot of us, um, as you can see, overeat. But. Um, it's interesting, just I think it's interesting to kind of look and see how that sort of comes about. 
And this comes from a Time Magazine a publication from, I think, about a year ago. This is a typical American family and a week's worth of food, okay? And you'll see lots of meats, an incredible amount of prepared food, but, and a lot of stuff, okay? This, I believe, is a fairly affluent Mexican family. This, I think, is an Italian family. It might be a Swiss family, but I think it's an Italian family. This is the equivalent of a family in Ecuador, and this is the equivalent of a family in Ethiopia. So a tremendous difference. So that puts a little bit more of a picture in your mind between what these folks down here on the graph eat and what these folks on the graph over here eat. And if we do the same experiment for nitrogen as we do for CO2, this is what it looks like. Imagine a world of nine billion people consuming a certain amount of protein, consuming a certain amount of nitrogen. And then these nine billion people are eating like, I'm looking for my little graph here, eating like Americans, or they're eating like Chinese, or they're eating like Congolese. And they're eating the, this is, this is a function of how much protein they eat, if you will, and what the mix of vegetables and meat that they have. And so this is the current rate of nitrogen fixation in the world, both natural and anthropogenic. A large part of that anthropogenic is um, from fertilizer production. This is the natural amount of nitrogen fertilizer. And the only way you can put nitrogen in food is to fix the nitrogen. Okay. Now there's some recycling of the nitrogen, but nevertheless it's, it, it gives you an order of magnitude of what's going on. If you want, if the people want, if the world's people want to live like this, it's actually kind of doable with the amount of nitrogen we do, but we've got to basically all give up food and dairy. Or we can all just eat a lot less. And here again is the same kind of problem of figuring out at the intersection of economics, public policy, the environment, figuring out how are you going to share those resources with the people. And part of that is understanding what the world, what the globe can take. What is the carrying capacity of the world? And that's the job of you folks out there. Um, let me talk a little bit, just in, in the last few, remin few remaining minutes, of some of my experiences working at the Environmental Defense Fund and why I left and what I'm doing now. The background for coming to the Environmental Defense Fund largely had to do with climate policy in the United States. Some of you might remember that the Senate roundly rejected the Kyoto Protocol in 1997. They actually didn't vote on it. They voted to not vote zero to 97. 95, there are 100 members of the Senate and five decided not to vote. Okay. Um, and then Bush renounced the Kyoto Protocol entirely in 2001. Senators Lieberman and McCain, uh, two people, if you know, from the United States are not exactly the darlings of the Democratic Party anyway, were actually leaders in the climate change debate in the United States. They proposed a, a, a climate bill in 2003 that would cap CO2 emissions fairly radically. Uh, the bill actually made it to the Senate and it was voted down 43 to 54. The environmental community was overjoyed, jumping up and down with joy. They got 43 senators to vote for it. In 2005, Lieberman and McCain put forward another climate bill. And right around 2005, the environmental community was, was tooling up to get that to the Senate and get it passed. And that was the time that I entered uh, Environmental Defense Fund. And a large part of that was to try to get this bill passed. It turns out the bill failed. The bill got less than 43 votes. And an interesting reason why this bill got less than 43 votes, which is instructive for future climate policy, at least in the United States, is McCain, either because he was tooling up himself to run for president or thought it would improve the chances of the bill, put a rider in the bill for subsidies for nuclear power. And as a result of that rider in the bill, the bill stripped off six senators on the left who would not vote for the bill. And the problem in the United States is the cobbling together that conservative, middle of the road, liberal part of the political spectrum to get the bill passed. And that's the issue. So um, some of the things that I did in environmental defense, one of the first things I did is I worked on this public service announcement that you saw. Um, the Ad Council, it was an incredible thing, agreed to put forward these public service announcements that go for free on, on television on climate change which is an incredible step forward because the Ad Council in doing that, it's a nonpartisan organization, felt and its board felt that climate change and global warming was not a partisan issue. 
Now, they didn't tell people to go out for vote, vote for a certain person, but they told people to do something about climate change. And I showed up as we were beginning to do that and worked someone on the technical side of that. Some of the interesting data that you might, be, might, be, might find like, like to know is we, we argued a lot about what needed to be the message, and there was a lot of focus groups. And we found out that by far the message that had the most resonance with people was how this would impact their children like we heard just a few minutes ago, how it would impact their grandchildren. And so we made a series of, of public service announcements that focused on impacts on children. Um, we had scripts and I went through, I can't tell you, this particular one that you saw was a longer script and talked about hurricanes and droughts and everything and we wordsmithed and, 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 and angsted over every single word. I had a, an, a, um, a technical advisory group of some 12 leading climate scientists from around the world that worked with me on changing all the words and everything. And we finally got it all together and we went out to Costa Rica because that was the only place where we could find a track and a train that we could have control over for a whole hour, for a whole, for a whole day, for a whole day, sorry. And the, they put together the ad, which is really wonderful, and they cut, it, they cut all the stuff out. And they just said, global warming won't happen in 30 years, won't affect me, bam very, very effective. We were worried that this would be too, um, too over the top. And we did a lot of focus groups and we concluded that it was not. And it ran on American television. It was very, very successful for several months. And the interesting story is that after we ran it for several months, we got visited by um, the a representative from the um, Union for Conductors, Train Conductors in the United States. This is a true story, and it, it's actually interesting. And they, it turned out that many members of their union had driven, had been on trains, driving trains, and had run over people. And they were suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome, and they found that ad very, very disturbing. And we had to pull it. Okay, but um, it's interesting how things happen. I also got to do a variety of different things in the public media. I, I was on a variety of radio shows where I was cursed out and, 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 uh, and told to uh, move, move, move out of the country and move back to communist China or something. I don't know. Um, this was a show I was on, maybe many, many of you know about Katie Kirk. This was her penultimate show on the Today Show, um, next to last show. And I was doing a show on um, how, to make, how, to make, how to be a, a greenhouse maker and how to have your kitchen uh, carbon, low-carbon low kitchen. And probably I met orders of, I reached orders of magnitude more people than I ever came close to reaching through my science papers. What the impact factor of those papers was, well, of this, this was, I don't know because it's not listed in the web of science, but hopes, hopefully one day it will. Um, I briefed an incredible large number of Congress people and senators, virtually all of them Republicans, um, they were all very interested in the issue. Uh, many of them had an open mind, were confused. One of the people I briefed is this woman right over here. She's uh, Congresswoman Bono Mack. She is the wife of former Sonny Bono. Many of you know him from Sonny and Cher. Sonny became a representative uh, at the House late in his life and then in a tragic ski accident and died and she took over his seat. And, um, I have a couple of things to say about her in just a minute. So the McCain-Lieberman bill failed, um, but other things happened that were very, very encouraging. Directly after that, there was a sense of the Senate bill that endorsed a market-based market -based climate legislation, 53 to 44. The Senate actually went on record saying there should be a bill. What kind of bill, what it would say, they couldn't agree on, but they agree there should be a bill. Um, Many of us in the um, environmental community began working very, very hard to block the construction of new coal-fired power plants. And TXU, the Texas um, utility, in, uh, was planning on building 11 new coal-fired power plants. And they got special permission from the governor to go forward. And we basically put major, major blocks in, 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 in front of them to do it. And we contacted all their investors, their stock uh, uh, fell through the floor so, so low that um, two investment companies, TPG and KKR, ended up buying them out. And as part of the buyout process, they, they uh, um, negotiated 
that if they promised to withdraw the application for the, for the power plants, we would agree to not give them any grief. And we stopped the, 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 the um, construction of those power plants and put a lot of other companies on notice that um, those things will happen. And I can't take personal credit for this, but I certainly worked on those. And what I think is probably the most amazing thing we did is the Supreme Court ruled in, in the spring of 2006 that the Environmental Protection Agency has the right to regulate CO2 as a pollutant. And I think that it's more likely that we're going to see controls of CO2 through EPA action during this administration rather than through an actual congressional act. And currently we have the bill in Congress, we have a new bill in Congress called the Waxman-Markey Bill, which is being considered in the House, which is also a very good climate bill in my opinion, with, with some, some caveats. And the interesting thing that I just wanted to mention is that this bill was approved coming out of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, 33 to 25. 32 of the votes were Democrats, and there was one Republican vote. And that one Republican vote was Mrs. Bono Mack. And she voted in, in favor of that thing. And I'm sure it was because of all the things I told her when I, <laughs> when I um, briefed her. And I think probably I'm, I'm about running out of time. I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the, the bill that, that's in, that were being considered and some of the, the challenges that we have, but um, I think I'll, I'll skip that and, and simply just say that I think the decision, there is a very, for, for many, many scientists, there is a very, very strong bright line between advocacy and science, and that you lose your credibility if you begin to advocate. And I respect that opinion, and I've had that, I had that opinion for a long time in my career, but ultimately I decided that if it meant I lost some of my credibility, it was worth it because I felt that the issues were important enough to do something about. I left Environmental Defense Fund and came back to Duke University as the Dean of the School of the Environment there because while I was at the Environmental Defense Fund, I met an incredible number of really young people who were making a major difference in, ch in changing policy. And I ultimately decided that the most significant thing that I could do as a scientist was go to a university where those kinds of people were being trained and to make sure that that kind of program prospered so that we have more and more of those people coming out in the world. So all of you in academia, I think that's part of what you can do and you can maintain your, your, your clean hands as it relates to advocacy if you so care. So advocate, education is a major part of it. I think we also need to think about multidisciplinarity. Lots of times we talk about interdisciplinary work. I really think the key is multidisciplinary work. We need to be able to work with people across disciplines. We cannot expect ourselves to be experts on everything. We have to be working across disciplines. And we need to begin to think about changing our research institutions and our academic institutions away from being disciplinary folks, focused and being um, facile enough that they can begin to work on issues. You know, one of the interesting things is the U.S. National Academy of Engineering folk identified 15 cha grand challenges for engineering in the next century. And every single one of them was an issue. Not a single one of them was disciplinary. Every single one of them is, a, is an issue. And I think the important work that we're going to do, it can be basic research or applied research, but the important work that we're going to do needs to fit within a larger picture that relates to some of these um, major issues. And finally, communication. We do a terrible job, I think you've heard it many, many times, we do not do a good job communicating. And the, the important thing about communicating is, quite often as scientists, we'd like to impress people with how intelligent we are. And I think quite often when you're talking to non-scientists, they are impressed with how intelligent you are. But they also have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> and they, they hear one person is really smart, they have no idea what they're talking about. Another person over there, has, you have, they have no idea. They're disagreeing and they figure there's no way you can figure all this out. And they go home confused and they say, let's not do any, anything. I think the trick in communicating the science to people who are non-scientists is to communicate in a way that is simple, that empowers them, that makes them feel smart, as smart as you are, even though that's not true, okay? Um, and it's more likely that, in fact, there'll be, your work will have an application and make a difference. And finally, um, I encourage you to go to my blog, thegreengrok.com, and join my conversation on some of these issues. Thank you very much.